Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college football fans across the country and around the world. This is Tim May once again with the Tim May Podcast. What is this, edition 58? What is it, Spencer? He doesn't know. Well, nobody knows, ladies and gentlemen. Nobody can count that high, but we've been doing this every week now since July, and I'm very much enjoying it even here in the offseason because there's always something to talk about when it comes to college football in general and Ohio State in particular and Ohio State alums, et cetera, which is why my first guest today is an Ohio State alum. Matter of fact, he works uh, for the Ohio State Hospitals in the fundraising uh, efforts and still to this day, and he has two buddies who've gone on to fame and acclaim in the coaching profession. Uh, my my guest is Matt Finkus. Matt, how are you doing? I'm doing good, buddy. How are you? Pretty good, man. You know, you used to have a radio show of some repute here in town that I thought I, <laughs> that I thought was must listening to. But you know how people, when they change the format, sometimes some, suddenly you're country western, right? <laughs> hey, I'll tell you what, man. That's one thing I learned quick: is the media business is more cutthroat than any pro football or pro sport out there. It's uh, it, it's crazy. So I do uh, I dabble a little bit on the side here and there with some podcasts and stuff, and uh, that's about it nowadays. But uh, it was fun while it lasted. I had a great time doing it. Did the football ball fever there for i think seven or eight years yeah and, um it, it, it's fun but uh you know i'll tell you what I had, I had a great time this year just going to the games enjoying myself you know got to go down to actually you know talk about luke you got to go down to a couple of his games this year so just enjoying the uh the the, the, the time off a little bit but you never know I might get back into it again here again soon i was gonna say you got that podcast with torg right i mean uh, you're still yeah there. yeah you're- with torg and zach so we we talk uh college football high state then we do we do we do two of them actually we do one that's college football high state focus and we talk nfl too so yeah but well i you know i enjoy it but the bottom line is i mean you know i've always thought what what's always stood out about you matt ever since i've known you since you came from far away what was that piqua Pick Ohio, baby. I know, man. I had to look that up on the map. No, I'm just joking. Pick with Troy, one of the great rivalries in high school football, but I digress. Bottom line is, ever since you got, you know, you're always one of those guys that would speak your mind, man. That's what I've always appreciated yeah. about you. you know, so, sometimes and, that's good, sometimes it's bad. Yeah, but you played with two guys. I mean, you know, you were known as the three amigos, at least in my book. You know, you, Luke Fickle, mm-hmm. the middle guard, and uh, Mike Vrabel, the other defensive end. I mean, back in the uh, back in the mid 90s with Ohio State and stuff. Just, you know, just let's just get right into it. Did, did you see coming from these two, from those two guys, two of your best buddies? Did you see them becoming head coaches of repute someday, way back, let's say in 1994, 95, 96? Um, you know, I think Luke always, I mean, he, he, you know, he verbalized that even back in college that that's what he wanted to do. You know, he wanted to be a coach. He wanted to be a coach, a uh, football coach. He wanted to coach Ohio State. I mean, that's so we always kind of knew. Um, you know, Luke always had that passion and, and that's what he wanted to do. I, I think Mike, um, that, that hit him a little bit later, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, with his ability and his skill, I, I think, you know, he, his thinking was obviously playing in the NFL and then, you know, maybe coaching after that, but his focus really was, was trying to make it to that next level. But then, you know, I think it was, it was really interesting with, with Mike. I think, you know, it was funny. I was talking to him. I, I remember this plain as day. I was in, in the Denver airport, and I think Clay texted me that uh, that, that Vrabel, Vrabel, the word is Vrabel is going to come to uh, Ohio State and, and coach for Luke. And I had yeah. you know, talked to Luke a little bit about it, but he never really mentioned it because you know Mike was under contract with the uh, with the Chiefs at the time. And I t- I called Mike. I'm like, you know, hey, this is kind of the buzz around town he's like yeah he's like you know it's not been announced yet but uh but you know i'm gonna luke's gonna hire me i'm gonna go there and i'm like you got two i mean you got another two years left on your deal there and and <laughs> you know and then I mean, you're gonna make some decent money yeah. <laughs> you're not gonna oh, make yeah. that here yeah. he's like you know this, this is a jump start into a major college football program and so from that point on i think his focus really became on you know how he can how can he get to the pinnacle of coaching and uh you know even the move to to, to leave ohio state uh you know i mean i talked to him about that when that happened because he called me first one i kind of broke the story so to speak because that's when i was doing the radio show and he wanted me to know kind of the thinking behind it and you know he wanted to be able to be the head coach and he thought as long as Luke was here at Ohio State he was always going to be kind of behind Luke in the pecking order rightfully so so he felt that he had to move on and and find a you know find a way to to get to that pinnacle and going to the NFL was the was the route for him and you know aside from last night's uh, uh loss it's worked out pretty well for him hey 
you know, the thing about Luke, like you said, I told Luke to his face one time when he was a when he was still at Ohio State. I thought he could be a head coach sometime. I just he just had that, like you said, he had that about him. With Mike, mm-hmm. I saw Mike as more of an uncompromising sort of like uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to put it. I mean, he kind of did his own thing. I'll never forget after after the uh, Citrus Bowl when he comes walking out. I think it was uh, I think it was the last game. You know, y'all played in two straight. No, it was it was the '95 yeah. season. And we're standing there on the sidewalks, and he left to know in certain terms that uh, get the heck out of my way, except he didn't say heck. You know what I mean? I mean, he was just <laughs> sort of like focused on getting to the bus, but you understand what I'm saying. I mean, he was kind of a hard guy to read from a, can this guy be enough of a diplomat to be a to be a head coach or to be a coach, you know? And uh, well, Yeah, I mean, I think the funny thing about Mike is, you know, if he wouldn't have had the success that he had in the NFL – yeah. I don't think that it would allow him to coach the way he coaches now because he coaches very much like Bill Belichick, Bill Parcells. I mean, that attitude, that, um, that yes. demeanor, the kind of the no nonsense thing. And to do that, you've got to have pedigree behind you. I and mean, you've seen guys, I mean, you've seen the Eric Mandini's of the world kind of try to come in and, 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 and play the Parcells Belichick card and, and roll yeah. without the, the resume behind it. And it doesn't work. So I think, you know, for, for Mike's personality, you know, for the, for the way that he coaches, he almost had to have three Super Bowl rings to be able to be as brash and as outspoken and as no nonsense as he is, because if not, I think it, it does. You're right. I mean, it rubs people the wrong way sometimes. So um, it just it's worked out well for him. And, and I think obviously he does have the pedigree and, and you know, the NFL you got to have that. I mean, you got to have guys that believe in you. Um, you know, yeah. it's, you're, you're dealing with, with guys who make a ton of money and, and, uh, and, and you know, that's what's kind of surprising about some of these coaches, these young coaches, and you see them have success early and then they kind of fade off um, to, to beat a sustained success in the NFL as a head coach. You got to have some guys that buy into what you're, you're selling. And I think what, with Mike's path that he was able to go down, especially with the Patriots, he's got that. Yeah, I was gonna say he's got—he definitely had the bling going in, and now he's got. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's—it it, it is amazing. I mean, how much pressure do you think he was under this year, though? Because there was some rumbling, you know, mid-year when things didn't start out exactly great. I mean, did I don't know if you've even spoken to him, but uh, you know, you heard. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny, you know, we we talked before the season, and uh, and I mean, and he was. It, 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 Mike's a straight shooter. I mean, he was just, he wasn't, I don't think as optimistic about this season. You know, he just, he didn't feel like he had a lot of the pieces in place that he needed and, and that, you know, he was worried about how they were going to, you know, perform. And right, let me interrupt I think, you, you know, dude, look at his quarterback situation. Now go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to, to kind of prop up Marcus Mariota and tell him how much you believe in him, but you know, you, that, that, you know, just performance wise, he wasn't getting the job done. So, yeah, yeah. um, you know, I think that, that, Though they found a way to make it work, they found a way to to utilize. I mean, it almost kind of went back to a to a college mentality, and I think that um, you know once he he was able to move past Marcus Mariota, because I mean you got Derrick Henry. I mean obviously we everyone has seen what Derrick Henry can do. Like Derrick, you don't want Derrick Henry in a spread offense, and you don't want Marcus Mariota under center. So who's your better player there, and how do you how are you going to tailor the offense to him? Yeah. I think with you look at what they did last year, and then what they did this year when they started really being successful, just running the football and play action, and then you get a guy like Tannehill who you know he's not going to be a guy who who throws the ball fifty times a game and is going to beat you, but he's normally not going to make too many mistakes, and he's going to be able to utilize the play action and make enough plays to, to win a lot of games. And so I think it just fit um, once they were able to kind of move past Marcus Mariota that he was able to, to kind of institute an offense that really was more suited to the personnel that, that the uh, Titans had. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, what he figured out was shorten the game as much as possible. I mean, you know what I mean? And, uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's no secret. I mean, a lot of people do it all the time. And right. Most successful teams do it, um, you know, and sometimes they win Super Bowls that way. Yeah. You know, you, you play great defense, you shorten the game, you run the ball effectively, and you keep converting first downs, and then you, you impose your will in the fourth quarter. I mean, it's – yeah. The formula basically is old as football. I mean, <laughs> and it still works. Well, give it to me right now. I mean, what 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 has changed the most about Mike from from 2000 from night from 2011 when he was when when his old friend Luke Fickle calls him in a bind to you know to 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 replace him on the staff when Luke is suddenly elevated to the head coaching job at Ohio State to now what has changed the most about him in your mind? 
You know, I, I think it's just the the experience and exposure. I mean, Mike is is the the reason Mike was successful in the NFL was, wasn't because he was the greatest athlete out on the field, but he was really smart. Yes, you know, I mean, he could play. I mean, you know, Bill Bill could move him around to to three or four different positions. He played inside linebacker, outside linebacker. You know, he was a rush end. I mean, he was really he was cerebral in the way he approached the game, and he he knew what he was doing. And I think that um, you know, when maybe even when he first got into coaching a little bit. He was more of a, in college is different than the NFL. I mean, coaching is, is a lot of rah rah, and you know he was trying to fire guys up and 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 you know just get, find his way. And I think now he's really settled into being a cerebral coach. And and you know obviously you look at what he did to, to Parcells in the in the game there with the you know with the punts and the and, and burning you know almost two minutes off the clock you yeah. know using a rule. So, I mean, I, I think that, that that's really – that's that was Mike – when he was a great player, when he was at his peak in his playing career, he was a really, really cerebral player. And I think as he becomes a great coach, he's going to really fill that out and become a cerebral coach and, and more of a tactician and a strategist. And and I think that's how we've how I've seen him progress as a coach. You know, even just from you know the way he teaches guys one on one, and it's still kind of you know he still gets out there with pads on. And I keep telling him like, dude, you're gonna get hurt. You keep jumping up there, on those dudes yeah. like they're like you're 44. <laughs> you're gonna get hurt. Like and trust me, I get hurt all the time. I have surgery that I'm not even doing that kind of stuff. But um, but I, I think that you're gonna see him um, continue to to really focus on that part of the game because I think he's seen now. You know that's where you win in the NFL. It's 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 X's and O's, but it's execution. And how do you get guys to execute effectively? Yeah. And I think that's that's where the real motivation comes. I mean, you can have if you look at the most complicated offenses, they're normally not the most effective over a long term. I mean, you know, you look at what Sean McVay does, and and you know, and, and the, the crazy stuff that. Um, you know, when, when Chip Kelly was in the NFL, like, you know, those offenses don't work as well as just the basic execution. Like I'm going to execute better than you. And that's still, you know, rules. I mean, you, you, yes. you look at what, what happened to him on, on Sunday. I mean, yeah, the, the, the chiefs had more talent on the field, more speed and all those different things, but they executed, they didn't make mistakes. They executed well. They, they hit the, you know, Mahomes hit the passes he needed to hit. The guys made the catches. So, I mean, it's not a complicated game, but you know, when you get guys overthinking, um, that's where you get into trouble. And the best coaches are able to institute a game plan that is complicated enough to win and easy enough to execute well. Yeah, but you know, you just hit the nail on the head too. The reason the Chiefs won as much as anything else was they had a player at quarterback who made plays when he had to to keep the drives moving and had one of the great touchdown runs, you know, by a quarterback yeah. in NFL history in a, in a playoff game. And, you know, it's it that that's what you finally need, man. And, you you know, you understand that. But, yeah, you look at what San Francisco did against Green Bay. I mean, uh, they just ran the ball down their throat. And, uh, yeah, just, I mean, it's with, not with complicated. The guy you never they just heard execute. Of. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. They just, you know, guy has been cut seven times and, you know, he, he's able to come in and, and just because their offensive line is rolling off the ball and doing what they're supposed to do and they're not getting penalties, they're not setting themselves back in the chains. Yeah. I mean, I tell people this all the time. Football is not a complicated sport. And I think that some coaches a, a lot early in their careers try to overcomplicate the game and overcoach the game thinking that, you know, scheme is going to win. Yeah. Yeah. I think if you ask any successful coach from, I mean, you can go through Trest to Urban. I mean, even you look at this year's team with Ohio State and Ryan Day, you win with execution. You win with how well you 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 execute your game plan. And normally the game plan doesn't have to be crazy complicated. You just have to to be able to to win your one on one battles and execute. And I think that's what what the difference has been here with uh, with the way Mike is coached from last year to this year. I mean, you look at again, the offense and what it was, and, and even to a certain point in the end of the defense, I think you look defensively what they did last year from this year. And I know that there was a tons of injuries last year for the Titans and they were kind of struggling, but you know, the, I think everyone expected this complicated Bill Parcells defense because, you know, that's where Mike came from. That's where Dean came from. Um, and, and there was that to a point last year, you look this year and, you know, they didn't do a lot of crazy stuff. I mean, yeah, they did disguise the coverages and, you know, Dean's known for the zone blitz, but it wasn't, you know, bringing seven guys off 
one side and then you're leaving four zones vacated. It was all, it was all very fundamentally sound stuff, and it's just execution. Yeah. Bottom line is when, when a quarterback can run around, though, and, and keep a play alive for yeah. eight, eight <laughs> seconds, you know, everything goes out the window. That's, you, you yeah, just, that's that's his execution. It's hard for you to execute you, covering a guy for eight seconds. You just, hope he, you just hope he misses finally at the end of that, you know, when he throws exactly. the ball. Hey, <laughs> exactly. Uh, hey, Matt, you know, it is a slice having you on, man, and you know, uh, no wonder you uh, hosted a, your own radio show forever. And, uh, <laughs> by the way, it was must listen to uh, radio. I don't know what people are thinking. Well, thank sometimes. you, man. I appreciate but it. But I want to ask you this: you know, uh, you know, you you, you kind of touched on. By the way, real quick on Vrabel, as I, as I wrote about him a long time ago, and and have talked about a million times when he went to the NFL with Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh had no idea what to do with him. You know, then he yeah. then he gets picked up uh, by Bill Belichick. On the almost on the in the flea market, you know, it was yeah, the no. only it was the only offer he had left because Pittsburgh drafted him exactly. as a defensive lineman, made him gain a bunch of weight. Then they moved him to outside linebacker, yeah. and then the year that they did that, they also drafted Joey Porter, and they tendered him an offer, and, and it was a it was a league minimum offer, and Parcell or not Parcell, but Bill Belichick was the only other person to offer him a contract. Yeah, and but here's my point. Four years later, after Bill Belichick offers and puts Mike Vrabel in his defense, now suddenly NFL teams are looking for the next Mike Vrabel. You understand what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was like they didn't, <laughs> nobody knew what to do with Mike Vrabel, and then now everybody's looking for the next Mike You know what I mean? Now everybody's looking for the next Patrick yep. Mahomes. You know what I mean? That's where, that's where the game's going. But, hey, real quickly with you, you know, you were on – you were on some really good Ohio State teams. And I want to ask you this. Mm-hmm. No, you know, put your pitch in hole you. What was the best – of those teams, in your opinion, I mean, maybe the most talented uh, might have been '95. Was the best team '96? Yeah. I mean, what? Which? Yeah, I mean, that's that's exactly how I would describe it. I think the most talented team, when you look top to bottom, I mean, obviously you got the Heisman Trophy winner, Davy. I don't know if Bobby won the Davy O'Brien or was in the finalist for Davy O'Brien. Yeah, I mean, you had the Bolitnikoff winner. You had Orlando Pace won the Outland that year as well. Eddie I mean, George. you had yeah. I mean, it, it's a Heisman just. Yeah, I mean, and then you you know Ricky Dudley, number seven overall pick, was your was your tight end. The defense was the same that we had in '96, so you had all those draft picks. Um, you know, I mean, Mike and I were both draft picks. Sean Springs obviously was was a first round guy. Rob Kelly, the second round guy. Yeah. Uh, you know, Ty Howard, I think was a fifth or sixth round guy. Um, I mean, Antoine Winfield was our nickelback. Yeah. You know, I mean, just just a lot of uh, talent on that '95 team. But I think the better team with the chemistry and the way we played, and probably just because we've been together for so long. I mean, it's, you know, that offensive line. Uh, you know, Orlando Pace it's, it, and, and I think Jamie Sumner and Juan Porter, uh, you know, LaShawn Daniels, those guys, the only transition was um, at left guard or left tackle when Corey Stringer left uh, in 94. And then Eric Goldstein started for two years after that. But I mean, you look at the continuity there, Yeah. Uh, you know, Nikki Sulu and Matt Calhoun, the fullbacks for, the, for all those years. Um, you know, just that continuity up front. Yes. And then, you know, you look at the defense and, you know, the three of us, Mike Luke and I played together, started together for, for three straight years. Uh, you know, Greg Belisario was a starter on, on for, for the last two years. Ryan Miller was a starter, you know, the last year of that. And then, you know, we, you bring in Andy Katz more, but that entire secondary, you know, Sean Springs is a three-year starter. Ty Howard, a three-year starter. Rob Kelly, a three-year starter. You know, Damon Moore had been, you know, in and out of that lineup as well. But but this been, I think he's been a two-year starter. Then you drop in, like I said, freshman with Katzenmoyer and Antoine Winfield. And just the continuity and the way we were able to play together, just because, I mean, once you're with guys that long, it's just, it becomes second nature. Um, I, I think that that was probably the better team that, that we had that 96 team mm-hmm. and, you know, arguably a national championship team. I mean, you know, there was no undefeated, undisputed champ that year and it came down to a vote yeah. uh, between us and Florida. And, and, you know, I would argue uh, we had a better roster and, and, and uh, we had better wins and, and I mean, you can kind of go down the list of criteria and <laughs> look at it. I mean, the, you know, our wins against Penn state and Notre Dame, and then, you know, beating Arizona state who was number two in the, in the, um, Rose Bowl. I mean, yeah. and you go through that, and I think we dominated Wisconsin that year too, pretty bad. And I mean, in the wins that we had early in the season too, I mean, they were not even close. Like, I think we beat, I think we beat number five Penn State like thirty-eight to six. Yeah. I mean, it was just. I mean, so yeah. In my opinion, that was our best team, uh, and I think that team is when you look at the people that were on it, and and the way that we played, and the way that we dominated, and just that kind of one blip in the. Uh, 
<laughs> one blip in the schedule there with uh, with the team up north. But other than that, you know, I mean, I yeah, it never gets compared to and and it is one of the great Ohio State teams. But I mean, I'm biased obviously because I was on it. But I think that we'd be right up there with with just about anybody else. Yeah, I thought I thought the two best teams I covered uh, in the '90s. You know, the the two best Cooper teams were '96 and '98, and. Uh, both of them were slight surprises in some respects, some, you know, but, but not, you know, but, but the bottom Mm -hmm. line is if there had been a college football playoff in 96, even though y'all lost to Michigan, y'all still were number four, I think. Yeah, we were four. Yeah. Y'all would have probably still been in the college football playoff and had a chance to prove yourself. You know, that was, was, that's the beauty of today as, as opposed to yesteryear. But uh, what I want, you know, what I, I talked to you about this before we started today, but, how, so how, where do you put a team like that 96 team, that 98 team, this year's team, the 2019 team, where do you put them in the, in the realm of things? If you follow my drift, because do, do you yeah, I mean, have to have won the <laughs> national championship to be considered one of the greats? You follow my sure. drift? Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that, you know, you, you look at the, I mean, maybe there's a category of just teams that didn't win the national championship. But we're still, I mean, yeah. you can go back to the, the, what was it? The 1969 team. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, argu- arguably Woody's best team ever. I mean, coming off the national championship, but, uh, but you know, had that loss to Michigan and, you know, but, but, I, I think people for years argued that was the best Ohio State team that Woody ever coached. That didn't win the national championship. Yeah. Doesn't get talked about, you know. Seventy four uh, team, so, seventy five team. You're, you're yeah, I mean exactly. Right. So yeah. I mean, I think there's so. I mean, <clears throat> obviously, it's it's so difficult to win a championship. And I talked to, with people about this after the uh, after the after the loss there with uh, this year. I mean, it's just it's so difficult. I mean, there's there's so many good teams. It's so hard to win every single game. You know, I think that. You know, and I said this after the 2015 national championship. I mean, to win a national championship, there's a degree of luck involved. I mean, you can you can you can say what you want, but there, you got to be lucky. Sure. You look back at 2000. Uh, what was it? 2002. I mean, that team was lucky, and like I mean, Illinois. I mean, Illinois and and what triple overtime. Yeah. I mean, the fourth and two and, and against Purdue that crinsled. I mean, like the Cincinnati the, game. Are yeah, you I mean, me? you, you, yeah, you gotta be lucky. <laughs> yeah, you you've got to be lucky to win a national championship. I mean, you look at, at, at. I mean, I think LSU might go down as one of the great teams just because, you know, were they really contested? Were they really in trouble at any point this year? Probably not. Yeah. I mean, I watched a lot of their games. I mean, they weren't really ever challenged. Played some really good football teams and weren't ever really you know, put to the test is as far as like in trouble where they needed to come back and make something happen to win. But most of the time, that's what happens. I mean, yeah. it's just, you, you've got to be able to find a way. I mean, you go back to 2015, you know, you lose to Virginia tech. And if you don't beat, I mean, that team, if you don't beat Wisconsin 59, to, I mean, if that's a 42, 21 game, they're not in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're sitting on the sidelines or they're playing in the Rose Bowl. Yeah. 2014. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you had to beat someone 59 to nothing to, to get into the championship. And then once you're in, I mean, it's, you know, that's, I think what's great about the college football playoff. And I think even this year more so before Oklahoma basically just sat half their team with suspensions and whatever. But yeah. I thought this year was, was one of the best years. Cause I thought everyone had a, had a pretty solid shot at winning this year. Um, and, and I think every year that they've had the college football playoff, you've had at least three teams that, that have, you can say, in any of these teams can win, and that's a great part about it. Oh, yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, with LSU, LSU had the team of of, of, of LSU history this year, one of the yeah. great teams in history. And look, ever since that game, look at it, it's basically gone hand grenade. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. guys left. <laughs> I mean, you know, your Heisman Trophy winner is leaving, uh, coaches are leaving, et cetera. And, uh, yeah, so grab grab it while it, while, while it's hot, you know. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, consistency yeah. is a hard thing to have in college. So, I mean, that's what makes oh. what Alabama, yeah. what Ohio State, what Clemson has done here over the past six, seven years. Agreed. That's what makes it so impressive because, I mean, you get the, the Oregons that will pop up or, you know, the Florida States that pop up and, and you know, here and there. But, the, you know, but to be a consistent title contender in college football is just something that, you know, few people have mastered. Hopefully Ryan Day's got the uh, secret formula here, too. Yeah. Hey, real quick, you know, and also, by the way, you, you brought up something from when we were naming those teams that could have been. Uh, the 2014 team wins the national championship. 2015, they got oh, all yeah. those guys Absolutely. back. And they lose that game to Michigan State and don't get to play, don't get to defend their uh, their uh, championship. I mean, that that's yeah. one of the – Talent wise, oh my goodness! Uh, there's millionaires all over the place from that team. Hey, your last thing. Absolutely. What, what, what do you admire? What do you? 
what do you like about what you saw from Ryan Day this year? What what are this past season? What stood out to you in a nutshell? You know, I think just the the even even in the loss to Clemson. I mean, it, what I think that you saw what was different, and this is I think a different just style thing from what Urban does to Ryan Day does. And I think Ryan Day probably couldn't do this on on a whole lot of football teams except one as talented as Ohio State. But I think Ryan, where Urban thrived on chaos. I mean, if you've ever met anyone who's talked to him or been to practice or yeah. seen how he operates, he thrived on chaos. I mean, he goes back to that Navy SEAL mentality of you know, it's, we're going to create chaos around you. So when you get in the fire, it's going to be, it's going to seem easy for you. But I think that also might've led to some of those meltdowns. I mean, that might've led to Iowa. That might've led to Purdue where just guys crack under that kind of pressure when they don't need to. I think what was exciting for, for me was to see Ryan day. I mean, even in the times they were tested, just this team seemed so calm and so poised and so ready for anything. I mean, even down to the last second. I mean, down to to, to Justin Fields in that interception. I think that you yeah. looked at that team as they were marching down the field. And they just looked like we've got this. It's yeah, not a did. problem for they us. Did. They did. I mean, and you know, you have you know one guy make a wrong read at the top of a route, and and in a game like that, it can cost you. But I, I think that again, like just the poise that he brings and that attitude that he brings of just some some calm presence of just you know, it's just a different vibe. And I think guys have responded well to it. Hey Matt, if I'm if I've got a hankering like uh, when I'm done uh, uh, recording this podcast, and if I've got a yeah. hankering for chocolate, where where would I want to go? Do you think, buddy? I got you covered. You, you come do? down to Winans in Grandview Yard. Yeah. It's a uh, eleven twenty five Yard Street right here in Grandview Yard. We got coffee, we got chocolate, we got wine, we got some beers for you too. All homemade stuff from my hometown in Pickwell, Ohio, and uh, you can come down here and, and I'll, I'll buy your first one, bud. Who knew Pickwell was the chocolate capital <laughs> of the United States of America, ladies and gentlemen? Absolutely. Hey, Absolutely. Nothing better. Matt, this was a slice. I knew it would be, my man. I'm gonna have you on I'm gonna have you on again because uh I mean like Anytime, I said, bro. I used to love listening to your radio show, man. And the Torg, <laughs> you know, the little podcast with Torg is one of the great things out there. But uh, you know, no, I, I really, appreciate it. I really appreciate it, man. And uh, like I said, you had two good friends who've gone on to greatness as coaches. You know, I mean, let's face it, Mike Vrabel has established himself as one of the names out there. You agree, right? Oh, absolutely. I think that, and you know, Luke, I think has established himself as yes. kind of that next, next in line to, to, to take when a, when a big job opens up, you know, I think Midwest wise, yeah. you know, I don't think he's going to fit in the SEC, but I think, you know, when, when the next big job opens up here in the Midwest, I think that you're going to look at, and Luke's going to be the top one for that job. Would he take, if let's say it happened, would he take the Michigan state job if it opened? I think he would. I, I mean, I think that, 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 you know, getting back into the Big Ten, I think that's something that he wants to do. And, you know, I mean, I, I know he's had offers at, yes. at, at, you know, lesser schools. And I think that he's comfortable enough where he's at at Cincinnati. And the, the administration wants to keep him there as long as they can. I think they realize they're never going to keep him there forever. But um, I think that he's at the point where he doesn't need to take that you know, that Purdue job, that pit job, or, yeah. you know, whatever that might be, he can hold out and he's going to get, you know, a top level job here in his next coaching position. I got you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you heard that first from Matt Finkus. Uh, you know, uh, there you we, go, buddy. One of the great ones out there, <laughs> Matt, I appreciate it. I'll be over to get some chocolate shortly, man. Uh, thanks for coming Sounds on good, my podcast. Jim. All right, man. All right, buddy. Talk Thank you, you very soon. much. You too, man. Yep. Uh, bye -bye. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Matt Fink. Is still one of my favorite guys ever to cover at Ohio State. I mean, the three amigos, he, Luke Fickle, and and Mike Vrabel. I mean, uh, when we, you know, when when people start throwing out this is the greatest defensive line ever here and there about Ohio State and whatever, you know, that's my default line I go back to and compare to to those guys because they did make things happen uh, sometimes in a big way. And uh, we didn't even get to Matt Finkus and the way they clinched the 1996 Big Ten Championship with that fumble return turn into the end zone uh, for the touchdown at Indiana uh, the, week, the week before they played Michigan. I didn't want to make him start crying again. But uh, but Matt Fink is still one of the greats that ever played the game at Ohio State. You know, we'll be back in a moment. I'm going to have Boston. You know him as Austin Ward. And we're going to talk about some developments, et cetera, around the Ohio State football team right after this. Roosters is one of the unique companies that we deal with. They're involved in everything we do, from our personal foundation to also the Cancer Research Fund. And that's from the Buckeye Cruise from Cancer to all the events leading up to the Buckeye Cruise. They donate back to different organizations that are near and dear to their heart. And we're so fortunate to have been with Roosters now for a long, long time. All the folks at Roosters are just genuinely kind folks, and they want to make a difference. Thank you, Roosters Foundation. Thank you, Roosters Foundation. 
Thank you, Roosters Foundation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're back, as promised, with Boston. You know him as Austin Ward. He's taking uh, – well, you never take a sabbatical from covering Ohio State football, but he took his trip down to uh, his parents' home in New Braunfels, New Braunfels Texas. Uh, there's only a few people in the world that know where that is. I know where that is. And Boston, you know him as Austin Ward. Boston, uh, how do you like it down there, man? I love it. Yeah, I wish that uh, – it's actually – it's been like, you know, a little bit in the 40s and 50s with the weather, so everybody down here is – buttoned up in coats and yeah you know i would have liked a little bit warmer weather but i've you know me i've still been wearing shorts i'll take that it's fine uh it's been great to like you said you'd never fully unplug from ohio state football it goes 365 days a year uh and then there's you know obviously other stuff developing now with roster situation Kerry combs and all that going on but Kerry combs uh, yeah yeah some guy that we've talked about just a little bit on the show over the last six weeks or so but it's been really good because you know the other part of it is as you know with the way the bowl game worked out and this profession that we're in you don't always get to celebrate christmas on christmas so yeah, yeah got to see my parents and uh sister and brother-in-law and a couple nieces and exchange some presents and eat some ribs and uh, i can't complain one bit about that texas hill country brother doesn't get any better than that you know the, the, the show fixer upper on hgtv you know they, they always show those those folks and they're walking around and like in Waco and they're walking around with like jackets on and stuff. And I go, clearly this is filmed somewhere between November and March, you know, cause I grew up in Texas <laughs> and these days I only visit now, uh, during that, during that time period. Cause I was down there in the middle of July back in, uh, about several years ago and the temperature was over a hundred degrees every day in Lufkin, you know, New Bronxville, it gets just as hot over there in the middle yeah. of Texas. And, uh, you know, this is like I say, this is the time to visit. Agreed. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, my mom's birthday is July 3rd. So uh -huh. I've made this trip down here more than a few times uh -huh. uh, in the summer to sweat it out. I guess if you take between the two, this is the one you want. But, uh, you know, either way, there's going to be cold beer and I can live with that. Yeah, you know, I was going to say when planes are taking off from Austin, you know, they got to, in that time of the thing, they got to use, they got to worry about the density altitude because it's so damn hot. <laughs> but, uh, but I digress. Yeah. Uh, bottom line is, Kerry Combs uh, being named the uh, defensive backs coach at Ohio State, returning, uh, returning to his, I don't know if it'll be in the same office, but uh, you, you were, <laughs> you broke this story. You broke the, the idea that Kerry Combs was coming back almost a month ago, and uh, basically a month ago, and here here it is, it's happened. Uh, just what's your what are your thoughts on that? Number one, uh, uh, Austin, what Boston? What do you think he will bring to the table that he didn't have before? Yeah, I think that you know we've alluded to this a couple times, Tim, that if his aspiration is, which we we have a pretty good feel that he wants deep down to be a head coach someday. He tried to take a different approach to uh, bolster the resume and help take the next step in his career. And it doesn't usually wind up being you leave one school, you go to the NFL and then go right back to that other school to help your career. That sort of, you know, zigzag and boomerang is, is a bit unusual. But for Kerry Combs, you know, two years of learning. Uh, and I, I hate to say that learning with somebody who has as much experience coaching in the profession as he does, but you know, the NFL level with what they do schematically and X's and O's and the film study and the endless amount of hours that you can spend to it. It's just different. It is a more complex game yeah. uh, than what is played at college football. Now Ohio state runs uh, for the most part, a, a pretty versatile uh, and, and pro level kind of scheme. Jeff Halfley did a phenomenal job. Greg Madison did a great job. Those two guys co-coordinating last year of taking, uh, you know, what had sort of become stale for Ohio state and taking it to the next level. Now, Kerry Combs is going to bring – he's not going to have to come in and overhaul the defense. Uh, Ryan Day's got this vision for what he wants with the single high safety and three corners and and so on and so forth. Uh, but there's nobody, I, I don't think, better equipped to come in and help uh, lead this reload of the position. He's had to deal with attrition, you know, throughout his previous career at Ohio State, losing guys in the NFL draft. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and I, you know, he is a – relentless maniacal recruiter and developer of talent and uh, a really fun guy to be around uh, on top of that. So all of that is positive. And I think that this, this helps him now he's going to you know have some of this more responsibility co-coordinating the defense. Uh, he's going to have, um, you know, the, an opportunity now to catch the eye of <clears throat> programs 
let's say Luke Fickle moves on from Cincinnati after next year. Well, Kerry Combs has been in the mix for that you know job before and come up short. Now you've got a different thing to sell uh, if, as as he tries, whether it's next year, a couple years down the road, where he can have that reach that uh, plateau or reach that peak of his career and become a head coach. And and now Ryan Day has somebody that can can steady the ship a little bit after you know Clark Phillips decommits and Cam Martinez gets cold feet and uh, you got this guy to go post some really long hashtags and jump on couches and, yep. and sell the program again. I, I think it's a a huge win for Ryan Day. You left out another bromide. Plant the flag. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he's planted more flags, I think, uh, than uh, uh, than Sir Edmund Hillary. But I digress. <laughs> uh, bottom line, I mean, I you know, you and I both. He's he's a joy. When he was here, he was a joy to be around. I mean, in interview situations and stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, and and like I, I keep reminding people, we talked about this on our previous podcast when this, you know, the worst kept secret in the world, and uh, we kept talking about the worst kept secret in the world of Kerry Combs returning to Ohio State is uh, just the passion he brings, but also the depth that he brings from being a former high school assistant coach to high school head coach who won a state championship to uh, working at University of Cincinnati under – Brian Kelly and Butch Jones to working under Urban Meyer to working under Mike Vrabel on an NFL staff to returning. Yeah. I mean, uh, there are a lot of people with a resume like that, and he can relate to every level of football. And uh, and now when he goes and you know and sells Ohio State football to these guys, you know he's been to the league. Now he can tell them what it's like. What not only what it's like to be in the league, but what what is expected of players? That is such a huge selling point, in my opinion. You agree? Yeah, and <clears throat> he always had that on his resume where you could point to it and say, I mean that that streak that he helped produce of uh, first round cornerbacks. That's yeah, uh, I don't believe has has ever been duplicated. I think it's a one of a kind run. Yeah. He is. He could already say, look, I can get you guys to the NFL. I've done it. But now he's on top of that, he gets to say. Well, he did a really good job with the Titans. I, I don't know where they finished the regular season, but I know when I was looking at this, uh, uh, the weekend of the Heisman ceremony when Jeff Halfley left, and it became pretty clear that Kerry Combs was the top uh, and maybe only priority for Ohio State to fill that position. I think they were eighth in the league, Tennessee, against the pass. And, you know, that's, you know, that says a lot in the league that throws it as much as the NFL these days. Uh, to be in that position because it was a, a little bit of a struggle for the Titans to make the playoffs. But you saw what they did in, in shutting down Tom Brady and Lamar Jackson and to get those two wins in the playoffs. And, you know, he doesn't – Kerry Combs doesn't solely get the credit. Uh, there's a bunch of people on a, a defensive coaching staff in the NFL, but yeah, certainly his cornerbacks – yeah, yeah, certainly his cornerbacks were a big part of that. So he can say, I got guys to the NFL. I coached guys well in the NFL. Uh, there's not a lot more that you can ask for there. You know, you know what's funny is you look back on that game that they lost to Kansas City, and they were up, obviously, in that game. But the big plays in that game were Patrick Mahomes running. And yeah. the reason he had to run is because his receivers were covered. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then, then when you adjust and try to take that out of the game, then, uh, you know, the dam kind of creates leaks, et cetera. But, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, they just ran into a – ran into a quarterback who was maybe a combination of Tom Brady and Lamar Jackson and just was too tough, <laughs> too tough to tame. But I thought, I thought actually Kerry Combs, his group played well in that game until, like I said, until the dam, dam broke. And uh, that's the way yeah. it goes sometimes, but who expected them to get to the uh, AFC championship game in the first place. Right. Yeah. And, and really, I mean, you don't, you're not expected to get any breaks when you're the sixth seed, but uh, man, if just one other game could have gone their way, so they didn't have to face, Brady Jackson and Patrick Mahomes all in a row. Yeah. Uh, maybe you, maybe we're talking about a different story and, and Vrabel and Kerry Combs continuing that fairy tale run, but even, even then they still would have had to play Deshaun Watson. So, Correct. uh, you know, there's really no easy path in the AFC. So the, you know, getting to that title game for the Titans this year, that's, that's a big success. And I think that, you know, they'll look back and say, Hey, maybe that's one of the last times Brady plays a game, uh, and Lamar Jackson wins the NFL MVP probably. Yeah. Uh, maybe he's up there with Mahomes, and Kerry Combs can say, "I beat them both." Yeah, exactly. Uh, what do you let's let's jump jump ship here now, or jump onto another part of the ship, uh, uh, the transfer portal ship, the the comings and goings. I mean, obviously Alex Williams uh, entered the portal uh, recently. You know, defensive end uh, project yeah. kid from Pickerington, but. 
how, how is this how is this uh, roster settling out right now? How is it going to get to 85 scholarships? Do you think uh, by the start of preseason camp next year? I think you know Alex Williams is really. I, I was thinking about it last week. Um, this is the time, you know, this and then after spring ball is really when you'd see some movement. And I think for Alex Williams, he recognized, uh, you know, as you, you said, he was a project and he knew that all the time coming into Ohio state, it's yes. not going to be easy. Uh, and, but he did a pretty great job, I think of developing, uh, his body physically. He saw just a couple of flashes when he got on the field where, Hey, maybe, maybe something could happen there, but there's just so much talent. Uh, I don't know. Ohio state defensive line. Um, that was, I maybe should have thought about that sooner as a, a way that, uh, look at a guy who could find somewhere else to go. Cause I think he'll be able to play. Um, and now you've got this, you know, you've got a couple, uh, houses for former Buckeyes at Cincinnati and now Rutgers as well. Maybe even Boston college, yeah. uh, with Jeff Haffey with some familiarity. And he, I think, I think you'll see, uh, a couple other situations like that play out on the defensive side of the ball. I always hate to, you know, name any names because that's not fair to the agreed, kids who, uh, and, and so I won't play that game. But if you're, if you're looking at them, you know, linebacker, there are so many people there. There's going to be hard decisions for guys who, um, you know, six, seven, uh, eight guys on that depth chart. Ohio state will, will try and play five or six of them maybe next season with, with Al Washington. Uh, but man, it's, it, yeah. That's a heated competition. I don't know that you would expect anything to happen imminently at that in that group, uh, or maybe the offensive line where there's also kind of now for the first time in a decade a log jam of talent and some guys who don't have a clear path to playing time thanks to you know Fair Munford and, and Josh Myers and Wyatt Davis all returning. That'd be another place that uh, guys are going to have tough decisions. And you know there's there's a couple other players if you look back at the availability reports that were released last season who missed all or most of the year. Uh, sometimes those can transpire and, and become uh, medical disqualifications. And uh, yeah. that's a decision for the training staff. And again, not one that, uh, you know, you, you don't want to step on any toes with that one either, but there, I, I think that not only could they get to 85, but I think they could get one or two under, which uh, is important. If, you know, if Kerry Combs locks up Cam Martinez, uh, and they sign him in February. And, and I think Berm has suggested that now Ohio State is content to be done with the 2020 class other than Cam Martinez. But yeah, I, I think they'd probably like to have room for uh, one or two spots on, on the transfer portal going the other way, Yes, um, mostly at cornerback. So I, I think that those numbers are very doable. I know there's always this panic and people are counting them up. And in January – I, I think Ohio State is always going to be at 88 or 89 people. Yeah. There's this 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 transition is inevitable every year. The attrition is going to happen, but I think that there are pretty uh, pretty clear pathways forward. Why Ryan Day has not had any problems when he's been asked about it, saying it's going to work out just fine. Yeah, you know, it's it, it, college football has changed. I'm mean, as you're talking about about it, that I'm just thinking how much college football has changed over the last 30 years since. I first started covering Ohio State as a beat in 84, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. you, there was this little, you know, recruiting started basically middle of that, middle of a season headed toward, you know, signing day in February. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, uh, yeah. And now not only do they pretty much have the 2020 class intact with the exception possibly of Cam Martinez and, a you know, a uh, possible transfer, uh, but they're – Man, they're so far along on the 2021 class. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. And that's what you have to do. Like you and I talked about this before. Just everything has been – once you move to an early signing day, and it's not really an early signing day, as I point out to people now. It is the signing day in December now. Once that happened, everything just checked up. I mean, everything moved forward from, from a uh, – uh, what do you want to call it? Musical chairs kind of situation. And it's crazy yeah. how you're making up your minds on – guys who just finished their junior season some of them you're recruiting them based on what they did as sophomores and it's crazy to project down the road well, and not miss on some of these guys and there's another part well there's there's two other parts of that one is 
it speeds up everything. There's 14 early enrollees already on campus for Ohio State. Right. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll get to talk to them, or we're supposed to on that signing day. <laughs> uh, we'll, that which will be, you know, that'll be a that'll be the most busy day that any of us have ever had uh, when Ohio State brings out those early enrollees to talk about, you know, their experiences in the first month and, uh, you know, it, probably the first time that a couple of those coaches will get to speak, Corey Dennis and Kerry Combs, but. Yeah. Um, you know, beyond that, uh, the, the flip side is for the current roster because you've already seen with the transfer portal. I mean, Ohio State had Isaiah Pryor and Brandon White both go in during last season, and Pryor left after four games. So, you know, with graduate transfers and, uh, you know, people trying to preserve that redshirt year with four games, uh, the, the, the amount of change you've seen over uh, 35, 36 years is absolutely crazy. But even in the last, decade plus that I've been covering it or even the last five years or you know since I got to Columbus the game has changed completely and you just never would have envisioned many of these scenarios where you know part of this reload for Kerry Combs I hate to keep going back to it throughout your show here but I mean taking Britton White and Isaiah Pryor out of that mix is, is still kind of a big deal because uh, those guys could have been playing in safety and now like all it's all in on Josh Proctor really yes. going into spring ball so that's you know, that's changed the, the, the entire complexity of your roster building, too. Yeah. And Josh Proctor had quite the baptism against Clemson. <laughs> you know? Right. I yeah, mean, there were, he did. There are some plays he would like to have back or, you know, Ohio State would like to have back uh, <laughs> that were huge in that game. And uh, But that's the way you learn is to make those mistakes. We saw Isaiah Pryor go through that. Uh, Brendan yeah. White, bless his heart, Brendan White, you know, just fell out of favor, you know, with, uh, you know, and by that I mean – didn't fit into the plans, for example, uh, last yep. year. And so uh, it's best to kind of move on. And because like you said, once you enroll, you, you know, the clock is ticking on that five year window to play college football. So that's the mm -hmm. way it goes. Hey, last thing before we go, uh, uh, Boston, uh, do you, I don't know. What, what do you think? What do you think as you look on it right now? Cause I know you think about things like I do and stuff. What do you think could change just schematically a little bit about this Ohio State defense, though, as it moves forward. I mean, because Ryan Day hinted at, you know, like you talked about, he wants to play that one high safety. Uh, yeah. You know, they they kind of evolved into that three-cornerback look because those were their three best players. Let's face it, you know, Sean, right. Sean Wade, Jeff Okuda, and Damon Arnett. Uh, but, you know, do you think we could see a more of a two-safety true two safety look, not necessarily once two safeties high, you know, the, the two deep look, but uh, do you see that's where they're evolving. They could, they could go that, they could go that direction as this season develops. Yeah, I think, and they did that a little bit late in the season. Once right. Proctor got, got healthy and more comfortable. I think it's, I, when I've thought about it and, and looked at, and, and I really, cause it jumped out to me uh, that quote. And I, and I used it in one of the stories on Letterman Row. uh, you know, on Monday that, you know, Dave was talking about his vision for the defense. And, and so I, I didn't, maybe I didn't pay close enough attention or it didn't register in my mind when he said it last Wednesday. But when I, when I think about the way the season ended for the defense and then you know, I reread that quote, it was like, okay, I think it's more about he knows that they have to continually add new pieces and evolve because once offenses figure something out, uh, and there's a lot of smart coaches in the NFL and NCAA football level that they'll they'll come up with an answer. I remember, you know, how quickly, you know, Belichick and others adjusted to the Wildcat when when that happened in the NFL, whenever that was, 15 years ago. Like you have, you only have a limited window before uh, a smart offensive mind like Ryan Day uh, is going to figure out how to beat that single high safety consistently. Right. Um, and so I think it's I think he knows that there has just to be uh, a second option for them. Um, and, and part of it, I think, is going to be that at some point, more of this true bullet position will exist. And if it means that you consider that <clears throat> the second safety, or if it looks more like four linebackers at times, um, yeah. Yeah. You, you know, I think that's, I think there is every bit the intention for the bullet to become as important as we thought it was going to be last year. And, um, you know, maybe it's a bit like that the H back position where it's hard to pin it down as doing just one role, but you know, Pete Warner, um, uh, he's going to be there. And we saw that they would drop him back to play a second safety. They've got a guy now, uh, court Williams. We went out to California and got to know him and watched him play a high school game. 
he can do a lot of those things as well. And he, he sort of looks like um, someone who's built like a Brendan White safety yeah. type, but also physical enough to go play against the run. So I think, you know, whether it's that's a true second safety, whether it's an extra, uh, you know, hat against the run, uh, some combination of both. I, I, I think that when I when I try and envision what this offseason looks like for the defense and what they want, uh, I think that I don't want to start this whole process over again, hyping the bullet, but because we missed so bad on that last year. But I think that that's sort of what they have in mind as that piece, that versatile piece that allows you, uh, you know, the same way that an offense tries to get you in bad matchups with, you know, 12 personnel. Well, yeah. if the bullet allows you to defend all that, you make it tougher to get your, you know, get out of position if teams go tempo or whatever. So. I don't th- yeah, but I don't think we missed on the bullet. We were being fed the bullet, uh, <laughs> you know, if you remember correctly. It was like, almost like a Gatlin gun, how many how often the bullet was coming out, you know. And and, and they never – I think they may have – you know, it's I, I think you could count on two hands the, the amount of plays where they played a – what we call the true bullet look. I mean, if you count taking Pete Werner and moving him into a safety as the bullet, well, okay, but that's more yeah. like a artillery shell, you know. So, uh, <laughs> but no, you're right. Hey, you know, uh, you know, they will evolve a little bit because I'm telling you what, they're going to be spooked a little bit by what happened in that in that game with Clemson when they suddenly got hit by the big plays again, and right. uh, and a and a cagey quarterback really made them pay, especially on one huge play, which got Clemson back into that game. I mean, that's going to – that's like you said, that we've talked about that before. People get asked me, how long is this team going to remember that? They're going to remember that game forever. I mean, uh, these, yeah. everybody who's involved, like, uh, like Ryan Day said, you can't let it, uh, you know, ruin you forever, but you're going to remember your shortcomings in that game from an offensive standpoint where things could have been better and defensively where, you know – Yes, maybe the waterfront does need to be covered again a little better than than you covered it. You know what I mean? And uh, that's where they're going. But you know, it's the great quarterbacks like Patrick Mahomes. We were talking when I was talking with Matt Finkus, you know, about Kerry Combs and and, and about the uh, Titans uh, and Mike Vrabel the uh, earlier in the podcast. And it's the great quarterbacks that find the cracks. You know, they make you pay. Uh, they can find the weakness, expose the weakness. The great thing about Ohio State, uh, you know, going into that the next season is I'm not sure how many super great quarterbacks are going to play, you know, but right. you've got to, in this day and age, you've got to build a team to eventually go against the great quarterback because that's who you're going to end up playing for a championship. I think that, you know, the, the other piece of that, uh, when you're playing against great quarterbacks and we, we've talked about how – uh, great Chase Young is over and over and, and the success of the Rushman and Larry Johnson. But um, I, maybe even in that game, they were so confident and, and, and really against Michigan and Wisconsin late in the year as well. Like maybe that it's possible they had too much faith that they could get home with four yeah. guys consistently and, 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 either, women, and, and cover the escape routes, you know? Yeah. Because Cone, it, obviously, Cone ran more than he did in the previous game. I'm talking about Wisconsin's quarterback yeah. and exposed some things there that Clemson took advantage of. But go ahead. You're right. Yeah, and I, and I think that that's, that's the other part of it that you take from the, the NFL game. Um, you know, if, if you don't if you don't blitz Patrick Mahomes sometimes and make him speed up the thought process, he's just – yeah. he's going to find an open receiver. And that's the same, that's the same deal with Trevor Lawrence. You know, that the most, I know what happened. It's the same. Somehow this conversation always comes back to Sean Wade and the targeting play, but yeah. you know, really that, that was a, oh. you know, they got creative. They used that blitz package several times throughout the year. Yeah. And I think it, it, you know, maybe it was because they caught him off surprise. It doesn't always have to be a defensive back, but you know, somebody like Baron Browning had a lot of success uh, in blitz roles uh, I, I still think he's got a work cut out for him if he's going to be a starting linebacker, but obviously he's a, a playmaker on defense that you want to get involved in some capacity. Uh, and, and, and really he had a lot of success behind the line of scrimmage. But uh, the point is, you know, without maybe without Chase Young, uh, and who knows what Tyreek Smith and Zach Harrison, if they'll be able to really, you know, make that leap to first round pick kind of status next year or not. But maybe the fact that they don't have someone who's going to get triple teamed uh, or, you know, they know we'll get home anytime he gets an advantageous match. Maybe that, maybe that inspires a little more aggressiveness out of them. Yeah. And that's not to say that they were, 
you know, conservative by any stretch of the imagination last year. But if you're going to beat the good players and you're probably going to have to play Trevor Lawrence, if you're going to win a national championship next year, yes. just to face facts, you know, that guy has to be under pressure and, and early in the game. And when Sean Wade was flying at him, he was feeling that pressure yes. and he wasn't nearly as effective as, as later on, but you give him time. He's, he's more than capable of beating teams. And I think that that's, that's sort of that next phase that they have to consider. Where do the, what do the blitz packages look like? How aggressive do they need to be? Cause you can't let, you just can't let that person beat you. Yeah. Agreed. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's, uh, Boston, you know him as Austin Ward, coming to us live from the great state of Texas. I'm going to go back down and visit my mom down there in a couple of more weeks uh, again. And uh, it's always, like I said, fun to visit Texas in winter when the temperature is down and the uh, chili, <laughs> the chili is hot. But uh, that's right, Boston. Thanks for coming on again, man. Uh, you know, I think people look forward to this part of this part of the podcast every week when we talk clearly talk about Ohio State football nuts and bolts and. Uh, We'll have you on again next week if you if you will uh, see to it, my man. You got it, and I'll see you Wednesday uh, at the Woody Hayes Center. We'll be uh, back, to, back to work in the great state of Ohio. You got it. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Boston. You know him as Austin Ward. And uh, once again, the Tim May Podcast comes to a close for another week. Uh, by the way, I want to remind you, you know, you only I have a couple more weeks if you want to uh, join us in in giving to the, the, Ryan, the Ryan and uh, Christina Day Fund. Uh, to uh, join us in in the uh, the the cup, which as I said, I I put 160 dollars in this cup a long time ago. Now I've turned it into a, a took some advice and turned it into gold bullion. No, I'm just joking. But uh, there have been quite a few people who have sent in what I call not matching contributions, but they have decided to join in. And one guy matched it, by the way, uh, dollar for dollar, and and I definitely appreciate that. But uh, if you want to still join in and any contribution will do, I mean, from a dollar to $10 to $25, just to be part of this, uh, through uh, Letterman row, you can send your contributions to the Ryan and Christina day fund care of Letterman row 22 East gay street, suite seven zero one Columbus, Ohio, four, three, two, one, five. That's the Ryan and Christina day fund care of Letterman row. 22 East Gay Street, Suite 701, Columbus, Ohio, 43215. And uh, we intend to uh, uh, do a little ceremony and hand to Ryan Day. Uh, maybe we'll get one of those golf court, golf uh, golf tournament kind of checks and hand him a check with our final tote count in the amount, uh, which goes to a great a great cause, the Christina or the Ryan and Christina Day Fund, which helps with adolescent uh, uh, youth and adolescent uh, mental mental problems, et cetera, addressing those, which are uh, one of the great rising uh, specialties out there of addressing uh, youngsters who have problems dealing with the day to day from a from a mental standpoint, and uh, it's a great cause. But until next week, this is Tim May with the Tim May Podcast. We'll see you later. Thanks for watching. Subscribe below to get the latest videos from Letterman Row. We've got Letterman Live, we've got the practice report, we got rapid reaction. Hey, and you know we got Buck IQ with Zach Bourne. For sure. We got recruiting breakdowns with Berm. We got whatever you need. Ohio State football and Ohio State Athletics, we've got you covered here at Letterman Row.